There is this fascinating thing with shiur that they just think them. They think of them like Rasulullah, astaghfirullah. Yeah. Like everything we do, it have to be like it's like a source of legislation type of. So they watch what everything the sheikh does is under the microscope 24-7. So one of my friends is Imam Masjid. He said, I went to the bathroom and I came out. So a guy was waiting and he said, Sheikh, you didn't take water with you inside. <laughs> he said, well, he, can you believe it? He's even watching me going to the bathroom <laughs> and what kind of <laughs> things I took with me. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. said, why didn't you take water? He said, yeah, it's not your business. <laughs> what if I just went, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I want to release gas or something yeah. like that. It's not like it's not your business. <laughs> but sometimes also I notice that here in America like, or in the West, like people like you know, a little bit too much. Like you feel like being watched. Right. So I, give me space. A, yeah, give me, a, my, give me a break. Like you, and I think that's also something we need to be careful about when we, we look at you, we look at people, and we have to understand something important. Teachers and you have different personalities, and we have to respect that. It's wrong to accept to, to expect everybody will be uh, uh, Umar Sulaiman or Walid Bissouni, Yasser Qadi, Abu Isa. Uh, you know, uh, that's it. Like some people, uh, Abu Isa is like kind of had a, a little bit strong sense of humor, or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, people get offended. Get over it. You know, he's different than Yasser Qadi, different than Walid Bissouni, different than Yahya Ibrahim, different than, yeah. you know, Sheikh Haytham, and, and so forth. Just you look at the Salaf, Rahimahullah, the Ulama, the Sahaba, the Tabi'in. You will find them, the funny person, the one who always like very serious, the one who's like, you know, strong, the one who's like a little bit like have a soft heart. Yeah. There are different personalities. And I think we should respect that. Like most Muslim youth, I knew Islam was the truth, but never took time to study my own deen. I mean, I tried many times to open my eyes, but the style kept putting me to sleep. One day I heard a brother say he was going to a class round the way So I decided I would make my way and see what they had to say And I must say it was like nothing that I had ever seen So many young people all in love with their dean For once I felt community, so much unity was new to me The instructors reached out to me and taught me Islam beautifully They made the gray clear and were experts in their fields Professional and exceptional like the answer to my prayers I never wanted the weekend to end so many gems and new friends and now I recommend that everybody should attend city to city the impact is pretty amazing inspiring an entire nation on Maghrib Institute not your typical college or school but a chance to change your life now what's your excuse Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh this is your host Omar Suleiman for I21C podcast unscripted with my co-host Salman Butt, who's feeling a little flat today. Uh, so inshallah, I'll be running the show and I'll let him interject uh, when we can. So hopefully you've been following the rest of our podcast. And alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, thumma, alhamdulillah, we're very fortunate to have with us today the Sheikh Sheikh, as he's known from the US. We're here at Ilmfest in Birmingham. We did a bunch of podcasts yesterday at Ilmfest in London in the O2. And now we're in Birmingham and we're taking advantage of this opportunity to speak to our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Walid Basuni. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Thank you, Omar, for having me and your show. And thank you, Dr. Salma. <laughs> we'll try not to let him interject too much. Uh, okay. He gets carried away when he has the mic. <laughs> okay. So first and foremost, I have to say, utmost respect to Sheikh Walid. You know, mashallah, he knows his fiqh, he knows all of this stuff. But he likes his coffee as a black Americano. That's a real coffee drinker, Sheikh. I have to say, mashallah, that's, you know. Yes, that's the way to, yeah. if you want to drink coffee, you don't want to be testing milk and sugar. You just want the coffee. I think it's right. a sign of the purity yeah. of your fiqh and understanding of Islam as well, Sheikh, because none of these uh, frothy, watered down cappuccino mm. lattes would keep it straight. Most people will know you as the Sheikh. Okay, and uh, th mashallah, you've had a lot of... Uh, interesting experiences over the years. I want to kind of dig into that and ask you from your various teachers and, and you can name them all as you feel comfortable. Who was your funniest teacher? My funniest teacher. That's interesting. 
Uh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know about funniest, but uh, uh, I have one of my teachers who was very wit. Okay. Like, uh, you just don't mess with him. Right, okay. Like, very because, sharp, huh? Yeah, very sharp. And, and he will <laughs> get you like in a second. His name is Sheikh Samhari, rahimahullah. And uh, he used to teach Aqidah. Okay. And uh, I remember once he entered the class, and one of his habits that when he entered the class, he started writing on the board all the points of what he's going to teach today. So he came to, our, to the class by mistake. It was not his period. Yeah. But he mixed up between classes. So the students were a little bit... You know, nasty. That they let them write everything on the board. And after right. he finished, they said, by the way, it's, it's not your class. It's the n- next door. And he said, oh, that's fine. In al baqarah tashabaha alayna. Which is like the verse in the Quran. All the cows look the same. <laughs> and he left. So... Uh, I remember many times, like, he will be like that. He will back and forth someone. And I remember one of the students' name is Yusuf. He always tried to challenge him. And he said, Yusuf, Adelan, Ada. He's very amazing the way he remember the Quran, memorized the Quran, and can quickly get the verse that's yeah. suitable for the, for the situation. And it can be very, very funny sometimes. Uh, and he's, he's a great scholar. Like uh, as knowledge wise, this very intellectual person, but have a good sense of humor and sometimes can be a little bit dark. So you have to have a thick skin to okay to deal with him. Yeah, yeah. we got a few teachers like that in uh, in the UK as well. Mashallah, yeah. you know the the scholars they don't let you. Maybe it's their style; they don't let you relax. <laughs> so yes, they put it on you. Yeah. So okay, so that was your probably your funniest share or the sharpest share. Who was? Uh, the most generous of the mashaykh that you studied with or knew or spent time with? Sheikh Ben Baz, rahimahullah. Okay. Like, uh, he's a very generous person. Like, uh, I remember once I reached out to him for a friend of mine and uh, he wanted to get married and Sheikh helped him with like 30,000 rails. At that time, that's a big, huge amount of money. It's like, I would say, like in dollars will be like, in modern days, it would be like twenty thousand dollars. Like, and he doesn't know him very well, but he he knows that this man is like going to college Sharia, he's studying Islamic studies, and want to get married, and he never been married before. And the sheikh just want to help him. I, I seen the sheikh once. I walk into his office, and um, he got a letter from a woman from Mauritania, okay, and she see. said, "My son." Um, studying in Ma'had, which is high school, to go to college. And uh, basically, uh, he gets supported by Sheikh Mbaz. I don't know how it started, but the letter, the man was reading the letter to Sheikh, his assistant. And the lady was asking for financial help. I can you imagine, like, someone lives in Saudi Arabia, and this woman, like, in the yeah. middle of nowhere in, in, in West Africa. Then the Sheikh said, so he needs two years, two more years, for his st- studies to finish, yeah. then he told the guy, okay, give them two years, like of uh, f- secure the next two years for her son. Otherwise, he has to leave and start helping the family. Uh, then the, the, his assistant said, Sheikh, but the charity account is zero. Okay. He said, give her from the zakat. He said, it's zero. Then the Sheikh said, give her from my personal charity account. I'm, I'm here, I, I was there, and the sheikh and his assistant right there, nobody else, maybe some guards far away. Then the sheikh said, give her from my personal charity account. Then the sheikh said, zero. Wow. Then the sheikh, la billah, la He said, take loan in my name, loan in my name, send the money to her, and yeah. Allah will help me to pay my loan back. That's just an amazing for someone he doesn't know, yeah, at all. No, no, like worldly benefits. Yeah, he's not gonna be someone like you know, well, you know, be a a, a murid or like a student or anything yeah. like that. She basically uh, 
just a random woman asking him for help. And, and that level of generosity and also giving from his own personal money, yeah, you know, that's the type of teacher that I, I have seen. And I, like I've seen a lot of generous uh, mashayikh. Like um, I remember when I got to college, I didn't have a car. Uh, I didn't come from a rich family. So one of my teachers said, you don't have a car? I said, no. Then second day or like a week later, actually yeah. he purchased me a car, a Caprice. A, a whole entire car and he said go ahead that's yours and i was like shocked even my father was like what's this and i have seen a lot of like generous shiuch and, and those people i never felt that they did this for any reason yeah. but they're doing it because first they do it for allah and second because they are generous by nature sheikh and sheikh bin jibreen another teacher of mine i can tell you I saw him many many times when people ask him yeah outside the street like for help he will put his hand in his pocket and whatever money comes he gives I never saw him in my life count check what amount of money in his hand yeah he just do like this and give uh, and, and that's exactly how they describe the Shafi for example yeah. you read this, oh, yeah. so it's, it's it's good to see that what you used to read in books I get a chance to see it in reality do you think this generation of people uh, have that quality still, or have we lost it? Maybe it might be due to the fact that we don't carry cash in the same way. Yeah. And that, you know. There is, I have seen a lot of generous people uh, in the West in general. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily Mashaya. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I don't know because maybe when I, after I moved to the United States, I, I'm not a student, so students would be able to observe this better than colleagues. Yes. You know, so I will not know my friends doing. Yeah. But I think the students there are the one who should. I'm saying this, putting this out there, so the students can compare, can see, because that's, you know, we say you have to put your money where his mouth is. That's right. Yeah. So for us as a du'at, as a as a leaders, yeah. uh, if we want to take that leadership, it it has a cost for it. it yeah, it's just course. an empty word. It's you put your money, you put your your yeah. your time and generosity. Yeah, also, yeah. Yani my teachers, one of the things that not just only with their money, with their time, yeah, uh, they will stay hours and they will welcome you anytime. Accessibility. Read you. Yeah, uh, there is no. Even though there were some of them very famous, like Sheikh Mbaz, like. But he never ever come across like an elite status or yeah. celebrity status. Uh, he always known as a scholar, and there's a big difference between being just celebrity, because celebrity they have yeah. fans. So there's so many things going through yeah. my head, Sheikh, and I want to ask him. Maybe go just try and structure this in the right way. So, I guess first of all, I'm going to come back to uh, your relationship with Sheikh Mimbaz and some of the stuff. Um, actually, one thing I know about that you asked him. Um, but before that, you mentioned this thing about scholars now not being known as stars uh, th th then. So if you were to attend a conference and all the mashaykh that you studied with, imagine this is the scenario, you saw them, how would you interact with them typically? What do you mean? So for example now, mashallah, you're talking about the, the, maybe the haiba of the sheikh, and, but also the accessibility. So if you saw them walking around in a conference, you, as somebody who looked up to them, you'd seen them or heard of them. Perhaps you weren't studying with them yet. When you'd interact with them, how would you, do you think you'd interact with them? And I'm trying to juxtapose it with perhaps today, when you walk around a yeah. conference, how people are with you. Some lessons maybe for us, if we see some of the Mashaik, how we should be with them. And how were you with them? See, uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit like, I don't know, but for me, I... I always have respect for Mashaikh, but yeah. one thing about my teachers that I was not the quiet student. No. I, I challenge my <laughs> teachers. Um, I remember first time in my life when I met Sheikh Abdullah Dayan, which is a great scholar. Most of anybody studying Saudi Arabia will tell you, I don't know she, this Sheikh. I, most of you said I didn't study this Sheikh because he's a very hard to deal with. He's like an Amish type of Sheikh. Okay. Right. Okay. He okay. really very different than anybody else. I saw first time I ever met him, 
And he tell, I asked him a question, and he said, why are you asking this question? I said, because I'm graduating, for, I'm a student of knowledge. He said, what makes you a student of knowledge? Like this? <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> so I said, I'm in my senior year in college, in Kriti Sharia. Uh, actually, I just finished. I said, I, I just finished my fourth year, and I'm going to do a master. He said, if this is the case, why don't you have a bisht? Bisht is that robe that bisht, Shia yeah. wear. I said, you don't have one. <laughs> so then he, when he, he liked it when I said that. I said, okay. you don't have one. He said, hmm, I like you. Come to my class and you'll, end, you, you will understand your, yeah, any, this subject. Yeah, yeah. And he told me when to come. And I have plenty of incidents like this. I, I always felt respecting the Shia should not hold you back from asking and, and approaching. And I tell you, we get all this like, Alhamdulillah, Haiba, whatever you call it, or, you know, image. But in reality, shiuch are just human beings. We're like, you know what? I go diving, I go hiking, I go, yeah. you know, have fun time. I go... Drink yeah, black coffee. Black coffee. <laughs> I go surfing. So, yeah, yeah. so I do a lot of stuff like like many people yeah. would never think of. It. And I know some of my shaykh. I, I, I take them to trips and stuff like that. Uh, I know Sheikh Mbaz Rahimullah used to go with people out. I went some with some teachers and scholars to area where people playing soccer and feel like. Mashallah. So, but you I, went through a process though, Sheikh Khalid, in terms of you went out to seek knowledge, and you kind of considered yourself a student of knowledge, and so you went through that process. So you knew how to put people in their position. Today, I guess the average person has a very different relationship with knowledge. Or maybe you know differently, but it's it's often transactional or it's you know. People aren't dedicated to it. So their interactions with the Mashaykh is very different. It's a big conference, maybe you meet them for a little bit. So it's different. How should they then treat the scholars? Because yeah. maybe there's an erosion. I, I can talk about the last 10, maybe 20 years, how people would treat Sheikh compared to now. Not that people are disrespectful now, just the bar has been lowered. Which is good and bad, because there's See, accessibility, which there wasn't before. I wasn't raised in the West. Yeah. So I came to America uh, after I finished my master. I was teaching in university. So I'm getting to America very old. And I never traveled outside Arabia before in my yeah. life. I was born, raised, I born in Egypt, Egypt, raised in Saudi Arabia, all my life in, in the Middle Eastern countries. I, I, when I went to America, I barely can speak English. So. And I'm talking about 1998, 19, late 97. Yeah. So not long time ago. Um, so I came from a very different culture. But one thing I learned, uh, and I, I, I know that theoretically, that I have to respect the differences w between cultures. Mm. And that has not to do only with place, but it has to do with time. Right. So for example... I might consider this disrespect. I might consider this not haya. Yes. In my culture, in my time, but in this culture, in this time, it's still haya and it's still respect. Yeah. Because there is, these concepts are not defined by sharia. There is definition for it. There's a minimum for it. Yeah. But sometimes we want to apply whatever my parents consider as respect and haya and this type of concept to modern days, 21st century kids. I don't think that's correct. Okay. So... It was hard for me sometimes the way they talk to people, but I, I said to myself, you know, I don't think they mean disrespect. Right. Uh, so I'm kind of used to that. I, w I wouldn't, I, I don't really think about it much. Some of the stuff that I see, I don't consider it like a, uh, a disrespect or anything like that. Uh, versus yeah. somebody lived in Abu Dhabi. I mean, I mean, once I saw once, he was in Haram and was with him, and somebody put his hand on his shoulder. Like this, then the sheikh, when he's talking, he stopped and he looked at him and said, "Put your hand down." <laughs> oh my God! I was like, <laughs> I don't want to be that person. Yeah. He just stopped and he looked at him and said, "Put your hand down." You yeah. know, because in that culture, this is not right. Yeah, I'm not sure if somebody came to give me a hug or someone put his hand on my. You know, if I feel like he's like crossing the line, I will express how I feel about it. Yeah, uh, but but I I will say. To everybody out there, when you see the Mashiach, uh, try. And I tell to the Mashiach, hey, don't try to make Barry. I think you can earn your respect. 
You, yeah. know, you can be funny, you can be with people all the time, and, and you can demand your own respect. Okay. You're not going to get respect by keeping a distance and making yourself like above people. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's not something I... So we have this thing about, um, I guess, the cultural differences, the nuances of being... In I have to say this. Yeah, go on. There's another thing about here in the West. There is this fascinating thing with shiur that they just think them, they think of them like Rasulullah, astaghfirullah. Yeah. Like everything we do, it have to be like, it's like a source of legislation type of. So they watch what everything the sheikh does. It's under the microscope 24-7. So one of my friends is Imam Masjid. He said, I went to the bathroom and I came out. So a guy was waiting and he said, Sheikh, you didn't take water with you inside. He said, well, he couldn't believe it. He's even watching me going to the bathroom <laughs> and what kind of <laughs> things I took with me. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. said, why didn't you take water? He said, yeah, it's not your business. <laughs> what if I just went, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I want to release gas or something yeah. like that. It's not like it's not your business. <laughs> but sometimes also I notice that here in America like, or in the West, like people like, you know, a little bit too much. Like you feel like being watched. Right. So I, give me space. A, yeah, give me a, my give me a break. Like he, and I think that's also something we need to be careful about when we, we look at you, we look at people, and we have to understand something important. Teachers and you have different personalities. And we have to respect that. It's wrong to accept to, to expect everybody will be uh, uh, Omar Sulaiman or Walid Bissouni, Yasser Qadi, Abu Isa, uh, you know, uh, that's it. Like some people, uh, Abu Isa is like kind of had a, a little bit strong sense of humor or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, people get offended, get over it. You know, he's different than Yasser Qadi, different than Walid Bissouni, different than Yahya Ibrahim, different than, yeah. you know, Sheikh Haytham and, and so forth. Just you look at the Salaf, Rahimahullah, the ulama, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, you will find them, the funny person, the one who always like very serious, the one who's like, you know, strong, the one who's like a little bit, like have a soft heart. Yeah. There are different personalities. And I think we should respect that. Salam guys. Sorry to butt in. Eh? But if you're enjoying this podcast, please head over to islamtunancy.com forward slash donate to help us make more. And if you're not enjoying it, head over anyway and help us make better ones. Yeah, definitely. So the point I was going to ask, Sheikh, was that so you obviously have a bit more of a nuance or an understanding that customs and time dictates how people interact with the shield. So from yourself as a scholar now, just moving into that space and the fiqh positions that you've arrived at. And I mentioned earlier that you're considered a scholar, scholar in the sense no, from I'm the not. first <laughs> wave, from the first wave or I guess from the senior scholars or du'at at least, but from the senior scholars in the West. And a lot of fiqh positions, they would refer back to you. And I know I've spoken to some of the other mashayikh, and they say that they would often refer back to yourself. How much of your fiqh do you think you've, not changed, but you've applied the fact that you're looking at the West, and how much of a compromise do you think you've made? Looking back at it now, right, at the time, do you think how much, from based on what you studied and your scholars and what their positions were, of a compromise you've had to make? Or do you, maybe you don't feel that there has been any compromise. In principle wise, I I didn't know of any principles that I have changed over mm -hmm. the course of the years. Um, remember when I came to America, uh, yes, I was a student of knowledge and I'm still a student of knowledge, but my practicing of fatwa was very limited comparing to the amount of I have to deal with when I moved to the West. Uh, because of the nature of the status over yeah. there, there is hundreds of other scholars. You don't need to be involved. There is like a big difference between me in Saudi Arabia and being in, in America or in, in England. But when I came here, a lot of the theoretical knowledge that I studied, I have now to apply to realities. Yeah. You know, have to apply to s real situations in the ground. Yeah. And some of these situations, I never thought of my life I would ever deal with and there are certain areas where i became more mature more sure. uh pragmatic and i can give an example yes please um we were discussing at amja the assembly muslim jurist in north america 
um, the issue of Muslim participating in judiciary systems in the non-Muslim countries or taking roles in law enforcement and things of that nature or even military and, and things of that nature. Yeah. So very early in the days when I came to the United States, so for me, from a very theoretical perspective, somebody lived in Arabia, you know, see this as a very controversial and a very area that should be avoided. But one of the scholars who happened to be also from Egypt, uh, from the other side of, of the ocean from the States or from Middle East, and he said to me, Walid, if we say that in Egypt, for example, we don't rule by Sharia and the courts and stuff like that. If we said all the good Muslim who prays, who care for the Salah, for the deen, don't go to these areas, who will go to these areas? Who will be the judges and the people run the country and the, the most important departments of any country? Mm -hmm. In Egypt will be the communist, you know, which is yes. Shia. Yeah, yeah. He will be the, the one who hates the religion, yep. the, 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 the secular who is anti-Islam uh, anti anti and religion. Tell me what benefit the Muslim get in Egypt. Yeah. And what good for Islam or Dawah or, or, or society is. You know, the people who are not trustworthy, not uh, be trusted with, if you can't trust them even in, in, in religion, how can you trust them with people's lives and wealth and to run the country? Uh, then really that made me change my position about uh, things like that, you know, uh, and, and be more open for these ideas. Um, Was it still uh, a struggle? Was there still some angst? No, no, not at all. Not okay. all. Actually, I, I am very... Uh, uh, I encourage Muslims to be part of society at large. Yeah. And I, I do believe that this is um, the way for Muslims to contribute and to be part of society. And I don't think you need to, whenever there is an issue that you see, it is clearly contradict what you believe. You can excuse yourself from ruling in it, yeah. from participating in it, and you can do that. And, and I know many Muslims... And I also believe somebody from inside the system say, no, I object. That's not a fair war, for example. Mm -hmm. And I refuse to be part of this. And I'm part of that government. More powerful voice than someone from outside. Yes. So being there, it's important. And it's, we always hear this example, which is, I think, it's a very smart one. You know, if you don't have a seat on the table, you'll be in the menu. Yeah. Yeah, so right. yeah, so you have to have a seat on the table. So that's this one of the thing in the area that really I, I see myself matured a lot in it. Um, I didn't have experience before with dealing with non-Muslims, yeah. uh, other faith community leaders. Right. Okay. But because you live in America, I get to learn a lot about like other people's faith, um, a lot of um, from theological perspectives, yeah. and it's very interesting to see. Um, people's perspectives and like especially in fiqh and yeah but and is is it, did any of that no i don't see you con contradict because everyone's kind of their experiences shape their understanding but now you're in the reality you're living it you're dealing with some of these people do you think that going backwards you would change what you learnt, or do you think that you yourself should have perhaps would have appreciated studying elsewhere or under a different school of thought how would you what advice kind of going back would you give yourself then no i i i, I owe everything i am today to the way i was raised good mm -hmm. uh, and i'm i'm very happy and pleased and proud of what i studied and the mashaykh that i study with until today i travel twice at least back to saudi arabia and meet my teachers and study with them until today okay. and i make sure make sure that this point is once a year or two twice a year um, and they're still books. happy with you, Sheikh? Huh? And they're still yeah, happy with you? you okay. said, they said, That's the important thing. You could be happy with yeah, them. They may they, not be happy with you. They <laughs> said you're Americanized a little bit. Uh, I think I might adopt a little bit of... You know, culture play a role. And yeah. I think I have to understand I cannot bring American culture to Middle Eastern cultures. Like, But there are certain things some of them told me. You're right. Like, for example, I talked about women driving yeah. in Saudi Arabia a, a while ago. At one point, uh, I said, it's going to come, and you guys have to prepare mm -hmm. yourself for it. Uh, so I think there is some stuff that we still have in the overseas. 
heavily influenced by culture. Yeah. But I understand that. And I, I respect the fact that everything, it takes its course. Right. You know, um, so that's that's one thing. Uh, but um, when I, you know, speaking of when I go back, do I feel anything I need to change? I wish that we became more cautious sometimes that today ilm became universal. Yeah. Sometimes I don't see that us in overseas and Muslim world understand this. There is, I do believe that the concept of culture is vanishing by the day. Right. So it's becoming like a global monoculture. Exactly. Global village, everything. So yeah. there is no such thing as even this urf type of things. It's become very difficult to, to define yeah. today. So I give an example. I studied like thousands of students in, in, in the Muslim world when they talk about La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah ta'asimu dama wal mala wa deen wal ar. Like a statement that everybody studied. It protects your blood, protects your wealth, protects your honor. Uh, but that's a problematic statement. Right, okay. Because it might entail or apply that if you're not saying la ilaha illallah, your blood's not protected, okay. your right. wealth okay. is not protected, and yeah. somebody can read that and be misled. Even though we say that, we study that, it never crossed our mind at that point that it means if you're not Muslim, I'm allowed to kill you, you're allowed to take your money, well. But that statement in itself can be a problematic. It has yeah. to be redefined. It has to be explained. It cannot be left vague like this. And I think this kind of ambiguous kind of statement made a space for a lot of people to either attack Islam or to misrepresent Islam and to be misguided. So these yeah. kind of things that I wish we can go back and do a little bit of reform to the way we teach the religion, to but the how way... Many of us, sorry to interrupt you, mm. how, many of, how much of that is us driving it from a point of we now see it or because it's kind of uh, being not dictated to us but the pressures that we are facing in the West we feel we have to address these things. So has it been a natural, you know, journey to get to this point? Actually, this isn't right to frame it like this. Or we're being told and we're being put on the back foot now. So in the in the UK, we're saying that, you know, Islamic values, uh, you can't hold these values. So we try and redefine those values to fit into an acceptable paradigm in the West. So those principles, even those statements, and that's quite a stark one, what you're saying, I can completely understand that. But there's going to be other principles that you then have to try and relook at so it's more palatable to the west but i know you're not you're not saying that sheikh but can you see how it can then get lost yeah uh, what's the problem even if we say this is we we've been pushed into this because of the pressure coming from the west i don't see a problem mm -hmm. if it's haq it's haq no okay you know yeah. even when the jews and christian came to the prophet sallam or the jews came to the prophet of medina and said ni'mal qawm antum the best except that you guys say a statement which is doesn't go with tawhid can you imagine like the the the, the jewish community in medina picking mm -hmm. on muslim mm -hmm. in in the essence of islam which is tawhid yeah. they said you guys say masha allah wa shit or if Allah will and you mm -hmm. will. Yeah. Then the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, You're they're right. You should not say that. You should say MashaAllah Wahda. So yeah. didn't say, okay, that's a pressure that somebody coming from outside the my religion or my culture teaching me. I don't see a problem with that. And I think that's a natural thing that we learn because of the interaction with each other. That's number one. Number two, even talking looking back in history. Mm -hmm you'll find a lot of things get to be redefined because of either a bid'ah or a, or a wrong misunderstanding happened in Islam. So that, for example, before certain time, before Imam Ahmad time, nobody ever say, Al-Quran, Kalamullah, Ghayru Makhluq. There is no need for that. Yes, yeah, yeah. But after this bid'ah came that Al-Quran is Makhluq and being created, now they start putting it in the books of yeah. Aqidah. And the, the same thing because of this misunderstanding or group people represent them in one area so you now you have to make that point clear and i don't see a problem with that what i see problem with when you start changing the religion yeah and changing and bend our principles and and accept what's falsehood to please someone yeah. or you know and, and changing the religion that's it, it, we have a rule sheikh and it, it, imam al-ajuri rahimahullah said that he said there is a time 
where you cannot say the truth. But you can't say the falsehood. True. You just remain silent. Yeah. I don't need to have a position. That's why when people said, oh, Muslim, you guys have tawriya and uh, you're not truthful. You're just uh, trying to deceive the West. No, that's wrong. If somebody said, we don't say the falsehood. We don't say the wrong. We don't lie. But if I don't agree in something, I just, I don't have a, as we say in America, I'll take my, the fifth. Yeah, yeah, fifth <laughs> amendment. I'll just say that silent. That must be quite difficult for yourself, Sheikh. Is in, especially those who, they're not just uh, imams and, and shiuch, but they're leaders. You've got to take a position on things that perhaps, you know, the rest of other people don't have the courage to take position on. Or is it then you still, you know, still... I have silent? no problem to say that. I... I I think one of the problems that I see in, a, in, in, in 21st century culture type of, yeah. that a lot of people think that I have to make a statement <laughs> and comment on everything. I just don't believe that this is right. Or I have to go public about everything. Yeah. I have, no, I, I don't think that's smart. Uh, okay. I think you can, you, I don't need to have a position about everything. Okay. Uh, there's well, many things I, because my opinion wouldn't matter. Yeah. So you know what? I just. But sometimes people are looking, Sheikh. Yeah. But, but people need to learn that sometimes is the best thing is to just wait. Yeah. It's a bubble, and this bubble will go away. Yeah. Just just wait. In Nabi Sallallahu when they came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah lana suhayr. And, and they said, we are tortured in Mecca. He didn't say anything. He told them, Sbiru, just be patient. Okay. Sometimes we need to learn that. I think that's an Islamic etiquette needed a lot here. Yeah, I don't need to make a comment on everything and... Uh, no comment. Uh, if you study 101 politics, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's it just no comment. It's yeah. Because no comment is the safest things yes, for you. Like sometimes, you know, even some of the mashaykh in the UK, you learn a lot from what they don't say as much as you do from what they do say. Yeah. You know, um, so kind of building on this element of fiqh and you're saying the principles, alhamdulillah, haven't changed it's just how they're applied. So in the modern era now, we're kind of in some new realms so for example ai you know uh we're looking at ai we're looking at development in terms of medicine we're looking at financial services for example trades happening in such a new and novel way and we may have the principles but applying them and i know one area that you, you look at sheikh is the media um what's your kind of view on, on in terms of muslims and, and their interaction with the media in the west and in you know because it's it's Sometimes it can be a bit of a grey area, and especially perhaps some people who come from, I don't want to say more conservative, but, you know, maybe some of the things that happen in media, like the use of music, or men and women together, etc. And we definitely need more Muslims in the media. How do you navigate through this, and what's your own view on it? Very good. Uh, so, when it comes to media, one of the strange things that I, I, I hear, and I'll be honest, I hear it here in England more than America, that a lot of people tell me media is, you know, like enemy of our community. They are, Sheikh Walid, you didn't know, people here in England, the media in England is so anti-Muslim, it, it runs by this, it runs by that, and like so anti. And I said, I'm just, I don't buy this. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I think media is about, you know, making a story that sells. It's just like any business. For them, it's about it's mainly about business. What can be effective? Also, I ask many of those people, "What did you do to invest in building a relationship with media?" Mm -hmm. Like Muslim community at large are very, very new to this game, so it gonna takes time. It's gonna take years until what you see today. Certain community have big influence because they invested a lot of time and a lot of money. Yeah. We don't want to put time. We don't want to put money. Yes. Then we demand every single thing. I mean, sorry, it doesn't work this way. Yeah. So Muslims uh, in America better with the media? Would you think? No. <laughs> so, uh, uh, no. But we the the anti sentiment against media is way less in America between Muslims than really? uh, we, we kind of use an example Fox News and CNN and the way they talk. Yeah, but CNN, uh, you know, liberal kind of uh, um, news outlets are very. There is a lot of Muslims have platforms with them, and but but the community at large, and I will choose from the community the conservative, 
Muslims. Yeah. They are just away from the media. They just, oh, this is like some Zionist type of, uh, you know, thing coming to get us. And come on, man. That's, I don't think that's right. I think yeah. that's, that's smart. Uh, so when it comes to the media, I do believe that Muslims should be part of the story mm -hmm. and they should build relationship. There is a rule in, in, in PR, and I consider 101 rule, make your friends before you need them. Right, okay. We want the media and we need the media, but we never met our friends before we need them. Yeah. Tell me how many of us have a, a close relationship with the editor of their newspaper or come to the to meet with them, you know, provide for them resources that they can make stories out of that. Um, or get some leverage on them. Uh, uh, ex exactly. <laughs> like okay. in, in Houston, for example, uh, we met with one of the director or the editors in uh, Houston Chronicle, and we offered as a community, hey, in our community, we have a lot of doctors in every field that you want. If you ever have a story about anything, any uh, new medicine coming up, I can give you people who have a very high credential, you can use them. That's the leverage I'm using. Yeah. He knows that he can. I'm not just talking to you about Muslim community to defend us or to give that I fed hungries. No, I talk about real stories that average mm -hmm. American will can relate to. So instead he hears Muhammad making a comment, Dr. Ahmed making a comment, yeah. Dr. Haq making a comment on this issue. You know, um, and that's across the board. So, hey, we can offer this help to you guys. How many knows of producers and TV stations? Yeah. Not anchor, producers, because yeah. that's the decision maker. And, and it can go on and on, but the point is I encourage Muslims to go to the, to the media world. Mainstream media. But those Muslims who go to this area, I know there will be mistakes. I know the rules will be broken. I know there is maybe haram will be done. Yeah. But I think that in this early stage, even we might lose people in this process. Yep. But in my opinion, in the long run, the, the 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 benefit will be way outcome the harm okay mashallah i can agree with that so being part of the mainstream media and um, what about what advice do you give to people who want to kind of set up their niche media outlets and niche make pro, you know provide niche media like you guys yeah, well, we're trying to go mainstream here. <laughs> <laughs> good uh, absolutely uh, today also we live in the world of internet one good thing about internet that nobody can control the news anymore so, you know, your podcast can have millions of people listening to it. And, and we change the narrative in certain areas yeah. through, you know, social media. Yeah. Um, for example, very uh, clearly, um, the voice of Palestinians. Yeah. Uh, it, it heard much, much louder through social media. Yeah. The voice of many minorities around the world heard through social media. Yeah. They don't have that platform in, in mainstream media today. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad... To right. see that happening. So you must have heard of this uh, series in Turkey called Derelish Artru. No, I heard about it, but I, I don't know much about it. You don't know much about it? It's huge. People, even Mushak Sheikh, they're wearing the hats and going out and oh delivering. It's, it's, it's gone very, very big across the world. Okay. It started off, you know, amongst Muslims, but in South America, it's liked as well. Well, and know. it's kind of reconnected, I guess, people with a heritage, even though they're not from kind of the Ottoman, you know, background or from from a Turkish background. But it's reconnected people with that. And having been grown up consuming Hollywood movies where they're always the hero, suddenly the Muslims are at the center of it. They're heroes. They're the ones with the good values. You haven't seen it, so I was going to ask you whether you'd like sign off on it. But yeah, <laughs> you haven't no, seen I haven't it. seen it. I've yeah? not seen it at all. But uh, any I series that you have seen, Sheikh, that you that have caused a bit of a controversy amongst the Muslim community, but ultimately has you think was good for harm, uh, for benefit. So, for example, the Umrah series. No, you've heard of you've heard of it. I, he I heard of it and I supported it. Okay. And um, it, it, on my trip to Philippines, I think, or, or uh, Malaysia, I, I forgot right now. But I was told how people were crying just coming in, in hundreds and, and if, if young people together and watching it and I, I had this argument with um, with some of my teachers and some of my friends back yeah. in, in Arabia that they were so anti that series and they said no yeah. no and I completely for it I supported it 
I, I, I have a very, if, if, if you want to say a very liberal <laughs> view when it comes to acting, um, and, and I'm very open to see more productions about the Prophet Salam's live, Sira, um, uh, The Companion. Yeah, I, I was going to tell you about that. <laughs> uh, so that's one thing I, I, I really support, and I think it's very, very interesting. I, we got once a, a question from a, a producer or a group of um, production company, they ask us in uh, something Muslim tourists in North America about making a movie about the Prophet so, so, yeah. Then they said, when it comes to the Prophet they had s about 20 questions. And one of the question was about the Prophet himself. How can we make a movie about the Prophet and he's not in the movie? Yeah. I mean, you would never be able to make people connect to him. Yeah. So in in a movie, yeah. so they told us, what if we didn't bring an actor, but we brought, we made an animation. Animation, okay. So a computer generate a picture of the process of them uh -huh. based on the description of the process. Of them. Uh -huh, yeah. And in this way, you don't have this problem. All oh, this actor will be yeah, seen. Yeah. That's the pro. So that's how it is. And they ask, what do you guys think of that? And they ask us several questions about also the Prophet family and, and wives, stuff like that. How can be? And obviously, like, when it is brought out to the Mashaikh, everybody backed off. He, he is scared yeah. to say anything about yeah. it. And it's sad. It, for me, it's the sad thing is not about this, just the, the position, but just we're too scared even to think a little bit more in a nuance and, and think about it in another perspective. Um, so anyway, so at least the Sahaba, we can agree that is allowed to sure. do that as long as we give the right perspective. Um, yeah, so so, so I, I really would like to see this growing more. The Messiah, uh, in my way to, uh, I was flying and I saw one episode of it, a half, yeah. not a full thing. Um, uh, so, from what I have seen, it just <laughs> so messed up. Actually, <laughs> it's just the, the information. I don't know what's really the message of it yet, but yeah. uh, I, I didn't. From what I see, I understand and and ask people. This is not something that they saying that um, he didn't claim that he's messiah. I don't know. It's just all thing like ten minutes yeah. or all. So, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah, yeah so the guy next to me actually has playing it. And he said, Did you teach? we have a conversation about it. Yeah. And he's, so we start talking about it and he, he put it. So I, I can't read the subtitle, but I don't hear anything. Uh, anyway, I'm... Uh, These are the challenges of the time when you think that... Assalamualaikum guys. Last reminder, I promise. Head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to help this movement get to the next level. So we have genuine, high quality media articulating Islam in the 21st century and developing confident Muslims impacting the world for the better. Do you think, um, from your experience the last 21, 22 years in the West now, do you think that the landscape of dawah has changed? What so do you mean now, by the landscape? So now dawah in its traditional sense, do you think it still has a place? Uh, you mean dawah for non-Muslim or dawah even, to the even, Muslim? Even, even to Muslims. Yeah. It, uh, what's, what I noticed in the last 10 years, something like really hurts me a little bit, that there is no interest anymore to teach people about Islam. Yeah. And I noticed that in America more than anything else because that's where I live. There is... Before, there's a lot of effort, dawah table outside, talk yeah. about what Islam is. We kind of shy away from this a little bit, and we just, you know, don't care much about this. Um, there is regression or like uh, regress in this area. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't think that's correct. I think we should put more effort in letting people know more about Islam. And I, I think the dawah has to have two goals. Number one, if somebody accepts what I believe in, that's a blessing. Alhamdulillah, I'm great. But also there's another thing, which is al balagh that I need to tell people what Islam is. Yeah. You know, at least if someone have a doubt, somebody, his enemy, I will win this as a friend. Yeah. I will, a person who's neutral, you yeah. know, he's not anti-Muslim. And also I have 
explain to him what I believe in. Yes. And that should focus on the essence of our religion, which is Tawheed. It's not a political thing. It's not a. That's that should be the focus. And uh, and I, I, w- I wish to see more focus on this area. And the other area, obviously, the ilm, yeah. uh, the, the knowledge on, and learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and, it's, and this is something taking different shapes and a big struggle. Like for me as Al-Maghrib Institute, you know, yeah. part of Al-Maghrib, it's a big struggle for us to, uh, to maintain that large number of attendees for a class that a double weekend yeah. or one weekend you know you can see that there is a big change I, mean, in I shift. used to attend religiously mm. excuse the pun um to the courses but i find generally the people at the age that i was when i went they're not interested in the same way they the way they consume knowledge has changed the way they consume information has changed um but i also want to ask actually another question sheikh and I feel speaking to some of the different art and speaking to people across, I, I guess, from from even different understandings within Islam, that there seems to be a bit of a crisis of du'at. And I, I, I say that very hesitantly because I know, obviously, words have impact. Um, that the du'at that we have now, people... And we spoke to this earlier, Sheikh, about, you know, they should be accessible and all of this. But at the same time, it's created a type of access that has made people um, not disrespect but almost cheapen the value of Islam because it's associated with that person and as you said you know even the scholars do out they're fallible and this is something that seems to happen and when I guess the, the church went through this where there was a lot of um, stuff coming out about them how would you see this area now and the advice that you're giving to kind of people and also to Du'at and Mashaykh who are running, the, you know, working in this space? See, there are several aspects here, like, yeah. uh, and they vary. So one thing I, I would say, and that's a little bit also um, hard to say, but when yeah. I came to the United States, I found, especially among conservative Muslims, yeah. very strange views and ideas. I don't know where they got it from. Mm-hmm especially for those prescribed themselves to the Salafi movement. Yeah. It was really weird for me. Like, like either they go with what they call them, the super Salafi people, yeah. and like, you know, and like ultra Salafi. Well, far from superheroes. Yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> so, and it was like, they think that this is what like the ulama and the scholars are. It's like, what yeah. you guys talk about? Uh, scholars are not like that. They don't think that way. They're not so like narrow-minded like those. Yeah. They're, they're very flexible. They're very... I learned flexibility from Sheikh I, I That's why I can count on my hand, my both hands, what are the fiqh positions that I change. Yeah. I can count them. And that's yeah. very, very... It's not something to be proud of because if I change it for the right reason, I'm good. Mm-hmm. But I'm happy that this happened. And the reason for it, because I learned from my teacher and scholars, there is... A lot of flexibility in the religion. So that's that's number one. I saw many du'at very rigid, even in their fiqh opinions, in their in their views for the world. It's a very rigid, very narrow. When I came to the United States and came to the West, people are living in their own bubble. Yeah. Like like even I, I say this just to encourage the du'at who are listening to me and to the community to put pressure on these du'at to change this. Even among them who says, be open to the society, we should be part of the society, ask them how many non-Muslim friends you have. Mm-hmm. This okay. sheikh who said this to the community, like be how many priests or rabbi or uh, you know or, or yeah. non-Muslims that you know and you, 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 you can consider someone that you have a interaction, a interaction a with. Yeah. You know, or somebody like look up to you. But that's from one angle, Sheikh. Uh, and also, yeah. how much you're really involved. I'm sorry, but if you always wear your thelp and you always wear your, uh, you know, uh, 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 your traditional clothes and you're always in your circle, you live, you die in the circle, yeah. that means this circle will stay in the circle. I want to see these imams and these du'at, especially leaders, being seen as leaders to their community, yeah. seen to their students. Universal leaders. Yeah. Also, this like fiqh opinions that sometimes they adopt 
it's a very small it's like okay hey there's many different opinions about this why would you pick that one opinion just one even inside this school there's different opinions yeah. um the, that's one aspect there is another aspect which is also that one of the da'at once told me sheikh i want to quit social media moderation why he said because to see the talk bad the attack habibi those da'at who feel like disrespected do you know Sayyid al Musayyib, his shave, his was shaved, put in the donkey facing the rear side of the donkey, uh, his shoes around his neck, yeah. humiliated, and Imam Ahmed been humiliated. I mean, we got nothing just because somebody make a bad comment on me on uh, social media. Yeah, but Sheikh, that's one aspect of it. And I guess the other aspect I was going to say is this. How many different teachers as a number do you think you've had over the years? Maybe a hundred. Maybe a hundred. How many scandals of those hundred teachers? Maybe four, five, six. Four, a very small percentage. Yeah. Now, this is the point I was saying now, from the West and especially um, some of the younger Duat, etc. We may be even the younger. It seems that our scholars are involved in some sort of scandal, whether it's financial, whether it's, I mean, across the board. Maybe now the information comes out more and is shared more often. And this, when I talk about this kind of crisis of leadership, you get people, young people, who are switched off and they're going to people who they shouldn't be taking knowledge from, right? Because they say, when they look at our scholars, they'll be like, you know, well, they're involved in this or, you know, this experience they've had of them has been like this. What advice do you give? Or maybe you, you, can re you reject the notion. I think there is a lot of scandals also, but in my time, there's no social media. Yeah. So we didn't get to hear about it. Yeah. Maybe, you know. But I think one of the things that we, like, people came to me and said, how come Sheikh and so-and-so did this or got that down? And I said to them, they're not, like, perfect. Yeah. Uh, that's number one. Uh, we need to teach, because of the world of social media, we need to teach the people that you should not expect people to be perfect. We should not expect scholar to be perfect. Mm -hmm. I teach a course in the Maghreb called Torch Bearers. Yeah. There's one of the scholars I talk about. The only reason I put him in that group of scholars is to show some of the things that he did wrong in his life. Okay, interesting. Like, he had a horrible marital relationships. Divorces, marrying in secret, and divorce another woman. And that's wrong. But still, that scholar is a great scholar of his time. Yeah. They did not take that away from him. Yeah. Be and we need to deal with the scholars like and, and religious people to see them in the right size. Yeah. You know, don't think of them there to be perfect. Have the respect for them, but just don't look at them perfect. But don't make it like a sure. balloon that is so big. But Any touch, it will blow it up. Yeah. But yes, yeah. that's... That's from their side. Yeah. From the du'at side, you know, watch what you're doing. You're under, uh, uh, Sufyan Thawri was playing outside. His mother said, you can't do that anymore. She told him, today you became a role model. So you know what? Watch your, you know, your, your actions, yeah. you know. Um, don't be like going around and like, you know, khalas. You, you, you can't fulfill your desires of, of Unfortunately, that's what it is. You choose to be this way. That's what it's expecting. There is another third aspect. Can we please don't put our nose in people's personal life business? Mm -hmm. And also not every woman come crying about a sheikh. She's saying the truth. Yeah. Not every man crying about a sheikh. It means his truth. He said he took my money. Not every sheikh said, you know, I am a sheikh. It means it's true. These things, in my opinion, it should not be left for public prosecution. It should be given. Exactly. It's a this proper, yeah. proper channel. Go to the court. Like in in America, there is a lot of movement now to create like a, I don't know if I call it a, like a, a du'at court type of, you know, right. when it comes to spiritual abuse. Just for du'at? Yeah, for any spiritual leader who abuses his power with women, with, with, with this. Take advantage. You of take advantage. Yeah, yeah. I say... It is a, such a shame for someone to take his religious position to abuse a woman or to manipulate a woman just to fulfill his own personal desire. Yeah. But I would say also at the same time that I have seen cases where 
you know, there's a mutual consent. They get married. I, she chose to marry him. And nobody yeah. forced her. You know, yeah. nobody. Oh, he manipulated. I understand that. But at the end of the day, this things he said, she said, need a court. And in my opinion, we not. I don't think that's the right direction for the community. It's trial by that's media, the right. trial by public. Exactly. You know what? You have something, go to the court. Go to the police. Yeah. If he really abused his power, if he really fornicated, if he really did or something like that, let him go to court and be jailed. I don't care if he's the biggest sheikh in town or yeah. the biggest peer. If he steals somebody's money, let him go to, to the jail. Let him go to jail. I will 100% support that because you need a court system and court and judges is a completely different ballgame. Like I had one of the du'at, one of the people who who talk about one of the du'at and accused him with, you know, haram relationship with women. And so. Then I asked this person, I said, did you hear from the victim? Yeah. Now you making a judge. Did you? He said, no. I said, how can you claim you judge? Yeah. He said, for privacy, Sheikh Walid. I said, privacy? Is that even acceptable Islamically for privacy? To, go, to He said, I don't want to know the person. I said, how can you pass a judgment? Yeah. So... People don't know what judge how how you rule between people. They never study qada because yeah. most of these duat yeah. is not qadi. Yeah, I spent six months before I graduated next to a judge, part of my training, to stay next to a judge and watch how the judge works. And, rules, and, yeah. and 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 I learned a lot from this. So I was telling some of them, this is not how you handle cases. It's completely different ballgame. Some of those people who come online and says this and that about a person, you know what's if the judge look at that Islamically? He will take that guy and lash him 80 times and he will never accept shahada for him again. Yes, imagine that. And some of them said, oh, I didn't say he committed zina. Yeah, you said worst. You make it more ambiguous. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I, yeah. I, th you know I, I became very... Uh, Texan and Republican, <laughs> if you say, you know, uh, I don't know that makes sense to you guys here in England, but we have a say in, in, in America, especially those who are very, have a conservative views when it comes to economy, we said market fix itself. Right, okay. Yeah. So we believe in that. Yeah. Uh, so I always say these duat, market will fix itself. Okay. I can guarantee you, yeah, these yeah. guys who go this whole like, you know, Wash wash type of uh, relationship, uh, they not gonna survive. Yeah, community are smart enough wash to drop these guys and filter them out. Yeah. So, yeah. and I do believe in that. I I do believe we have to have a good guidelines. Like in our organization model, for example, we have a law: if a teacher marry one of his, she or he is a teacher, marry one of their students. So yeah. it's a class to many students. She's fired. He's fired. Okay. Good. Immediately. Because we didn't hire you here to look for a wife. I don't want you to go into class and think about relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, th that's somebody objects. It's haram. Sheikh is not haram. It's not about haram hal. But that's how it is. Even in the workplace, Sheikh. Exactly. You know, they say things that if uh, you, you can't enter into a relationship with a colleague. This is a secular workplace, what yeah. I know it. So, so put laws like this. Yeah. I'm for it. I promote this yeah. kind of thing. You know. Teach women about the importance of hijab. What's so interesting about this whole entire thing, the real issue is not focused on. Teach teach men and women about the rule of khalwa. Yeah. Teach men and women how to talk to each other, how not to cross the line. Yeah. A a and put these things in play. But no, we don't want to follow any one of these rules, but we want to make sure there is nothing happened. Okay? You need to have these precautions. Of course. Uh, they're there for a reason. And if you don't follow them, then exactly, you know, you're leaving things. Don't open. agree to marry a man in secret. Yeah, it's just a basic that. thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and and you will save us tons of of, of these hours yeah. or, or, or talk on social media. Just to conclude, Sheikh, I'm going to take the conversation back to your land of study, if I can put it that way. Uh, when you were younger, I believe you wrote a letter to Sheikh Bin Baz Rahimullah with regards to concerts. You've heard of a concert, uh -huh. is that correct? What would you write now, a book about concerts happening in oh the God. Holy Land? As in, yeah. how, how do you feel about the change that's gone on there? You know, you spoke about driving earlier, but there's other things that have gone on. And yeah, they, they just it? had in Riyadh the, 
uh, anyway, it just uh, yeah. it's just very sad. Like I heard, they had the Victoria's Secrets models going making uh, a show there, but I don't think they were showing lingerie. But yeah. like, still, um, it, it is sad to see the change. Okay, let me put the perspective of the people who kind of adopt this. Yeah, because we never heard we never heard their perspective. So the perspective of that side saying. Saudi Arabia is 70% young people. Yeah. Saudi Arabia has been treated unfairly and seeing Saudi has been seen as, the, even though people know, but like everybody expecting Saudi kids and Saudi citizens to be good Muslim, religious, <laughs> soccer, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Tawheed, the that children, the Dara Tawheed, he said for all these years, this has been the, the image of Saudi yeah. and that's the expectation. And a lot of people feel that this became a burden on them. Okay, Yanni, okay. I'm not religious. Why you want me to make, to, to you? why you take me to that standard? Yeah. So somebody came and he said, you know what? We're not like that. We're just like Egyptians. Yeah. There's no difference between Saudis and Egyptians and Moroccans and Pakistanis and like any other culture. Yeah. Why we have to carry that burden of, of being something that we maybe not. So, that's their perspective and they said that's why we want to open that door for people to be free you want to go to religion this is the religion you want to have a music concert go to the music concert you know um so they said because forcing the the youth to adopt certain lifestyle by four is not working and it has a, a bad so outcome blah, blah, the blah. situation with the people Exactly. So that's all the the world, basically. And they feel like they've been pretending in front of the world to be something that it became a burden on them. So that's an argue I heard from that side. Mm -hmm. um, and the young people in Saudi Arabia were talking to me like about this. Uh, for me, that is, first of all, I, I don't accept that this is the reality, that this is how... A lot of people in Saudi Arabia are very religious by nature. It's a very, very religious culture, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, even the young among them still, um, and and there's a lot of good, alhamdulillah, in the in the society, and still there's a lot of good in it. And for us, that kind of argument, in my opinion, doesn't fit the principle of Sharia, yeah. because in the end of the day, we have to rule by Sharia. Sharia came to let us follow the Huda, not the Hawa. Yeah. So. This kind of argument is not not because Egypt doing this or Pakistan doing this. It means it's correct, and the people look up to Saudi Arabia eh, 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 as There's a place of religious position, and you the land of Al Haramain and, yeah. and things like that. That should something not a burden. That should be proud of, in my yeah. opinion, an, uh, honor. A, a, an honor. You yeah. know, I think the value of Saudi Arabia. How many things that we purchase and submit in Saudi Arabia? Oh, that's very valuable. None. Uh, yeah. Reality is, yeah. you know, even when you take a petrol, you don't think of Saudi Arabia necessarily directly. Yeah. You know, but everybody when you think of scholar, when you think yeah. of ilm, when you think of right. think of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. This is the essence that you. This is a. This is your like capital. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you should use and you should build on. Yeah. In my opinion, and and I think this because every good civilizations, every good country, it has to have a story. Right, yeah. To be a great country. Yep. Your story is the Da'wat al Imam Muhammad al Wahhab rahimahullah. Your story is the that religious movement that you you have. I think you can develop it, but you can just disconnect yourself to it. Yeah. And that's where I hope, and I I inshallah I I know that. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect this land of uh, mm -hmm. Al-Hijaz mm -hmm. and guide the people who, who rule it uh, to do whatever the best for the dunya and the akhir Allah. I mean, I mean, Jazakumun Ahar. So uh, we're grateful and honored to have one of, I guess, uh, the outputs of the scholarship of Saudi with Sheikh Walid, alhamdulillah, who gave us his time and really enlightened us. Um, on behalf of the I21C podcast unscripted team, I've been your host, Umar Suleiman, standing in for Dr. Salman. But please do follow us across all the various platforms on Apple, on Android, on YouTube, different platforms for listening to podcasts. 
share, click. Please do share this one, right? So people know it's not just because Salman, the podcasts are good. I've, stand, I've stood in for him, so do share them. And uh, to show him that we can continue without him, alhamdulillah. Jazak Mulhar, don't forget to uh, recommend us to your friends and to make dua for the scholars that we're benefiting from. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.